Hello everyone, bringing you the Mannequin of the Month video for November 2019 today and we're taking a look at this, the mannequin here set up for uh, British infantry in Germany in the early 1950s, specifically the King's Own and this mannequin was actually decided upon by a poll on Patreon um, for the corporal tier on Patreon. Uh, there was actually a tie between this and Royal Navy uh, upper deck gun crew uh, in the South Atlantic in 1982 so, um, as there was a tie between them, I flipped a coin. This ended up being the one uh, that came up for Mannequin of the Month. However, I will be doing a bonus Mannequin video on the other topic later in the month. So keep an eye out for that. So, uh, as I say, early 1950s, um, a little bit of a move away from the uh, parade ground bull um, that was very uh, synonymous with the time period, obviously, in terms of national service and so forth. Uh, this is uh, in the field, on exercise, so some of the um, spit and polish has been relaxed. However, the cat badge is still nice and shiny, as you can see. Starting at the top, as we always do, we have here the beret, the midnight blue beret, which by the early 1950s was becoming standard. You do still see in photographs the occasional khaki beret turn up, but this uh, beret, I believe introduced in 1948, um, was becoming standard by this point though that said obviously troops arriving in Korea in 1950 you still see a large uh, number of the Middlesex still wearing the khaki beret and so on so there was a transition period there but by this point this was very much standard um, the khaki beret was very much a, a um, an oddity by this point you can see here the King's Own uh, badge which is uh, it actually had to have the slider cut down um, which if I just removed the badge from the beret here you can see the slider has had to be cut down. Normally the slider would come down to about here. Uh, to fit in the beret, uh, the slider had to be cut down. So this is one that's been specifically modified for wear with a beret. Obviously, originally these would have been worn with um, the peak cap um, or on the field service cap, um, which was yeah, didn't require that modification. And it's on a piece of red backing felt, as you can see there uh, on the beret, which is how the King's Own uh, wore their beret badge at this time. The uniform itself is the denim uh, uh, battle dress, um, uh, would be battle dress uh, blouse and trousers from this set, obviously worn with uh, the uh, standard if you're ammunition boots and uh, anklets, uh, obviously we can't display that on this mannequin, but this is a, an immediate post-war manufacturer, I think very late 1940s manufacture denim blouse, you do still see occasional examples with the pleated pockets and so forth, the earlier patterns, but this very late war pattern, uh, this late war pattern of, of denim have been standardised upon and this is the one you see primarily in photographs. Worn on exercise to save wear and tear on the battle dress surge uniform and it's very common to see in photographs the early 1950s man on exercise with the British Army of the Rhine wearing denim uniform in the field. The web equipment worn is very much the standard 1937 pattern worn essentially as it would have been during the Second World War and it would continue to be used right through until the end of the 1950s of course when the 1958 pattern began to be issued out to replace it. It would remain in service for some time longer than that with, with second line troops uh, but as I say set up here basically as you'd expect it to be seen in battle order during the Second World War. We have a pair of Mark II pouches still, nothing wrong with these if you're armed with a rifle they still carry the, uh, the ammunition for the Bren and the rifle as they should do. Obviously men armed with a Sten you'd probably see them are, are carrying uh, or using Mark III pouches uh, or the Sterling as it came into service. Um, but as I say, for men armed with a rifle, there's still nothing wrong with the Mark IIs. They're wartime manufacture, they're in stocks, they're just going to be issued out as, as needed. Um, so Mark II pouches, uh, obviously standard 1937 pattern belt, all still really of, of wartime manufacture or immediate post-war manufacture. Um, 1937 pattern went back into production in a big way in the early 50s. Uh, but obviously wouldn't be issued out at this time because of the Korean War. So most of the stuff you'd see issued at this time period would still be wartime stocks, which had been manufactured in vast quantities, and a lot of which would still be very much just in stores waiting to be issued out. Um, obviously, we can see the L-straps coming down here for the haversack. You can see at the front the two um, basic pouches. Uh, these would essentially carry the same sort of load that the weapons at the time were the same as they'd been used during the Second World War, which I've talked about previously. Obviously, you'd have Bren gun magazines, two Bren gun magazines, possibly grenades and rifle ammunition in a bandolier, um, as was standard, essentially. Uh, very little change there from the Second World War. Indeed, looking at the mannequin itself, you can see very little change from the Second World War here in many respects. Obviously, battle dress blouse, although it's the denim, denim example, the real visual change is the blue beret. Um, but we'll move this round now and we'll have a look at what's been worn on the, on the hips and round on the back. Something of an element you can see here from the return to peacetime soldiering is a much nicer bayonet than the spike, which of course had been standard issue during the Second World War. We have the number nine bayonet, which is the blade bayonet for the number four rifle. It has the same socket attachment, 
um, as the spike bayonet, but obviously has a blade, and the blade will be perpetuated um, with the, the later SLR bayonet, the, uh, the bayonet for the L1A1 self-loading rifle, uh, essentially. Um, there are detailed differences, but it's essentially the same. And the, uh, the scabbard is also um, interchangeable. So there we are, that's the bayonet carried around on the hip. You can also see here on the back, from the side profile, the haversack. Obviously, this is worn in battle order. You can see the haversack here, and we have the ground sheet cape, um, the, the, uh, the, the ground sheet rolled up underneath the flap, as we've shown in previous videos how to do that. And this is done in exactly the same manner. We'll move this around now, and we'll have a look at the back. Okay, on the back here we have the haversack, and this is essentially loaded as per the, load, the video showing how this is loaded, showing the, the haversack contents which I've produced. Essentially the same as that, uh, as the, the same uh, contents as you'd have during the Second World War. Uh, so pull over, cap comforter, hold all, and your mess tins, um, essentially. Uh, and then you've got the uh, the ground sheet or ground sheet cape, the Mark Seven, now made in green, newly introduced in green rather than tan. Uh, sort of Macintosh material, uh, rolled up and then folded under the flap to give some, some weatherproofing in exactly the same manner, again, as I've shown previously in, in previous videos. So again, not much of a change from the Second World War there, other than the colour of the uh, the ground sheet cape, which is now changed to a green and which changed in the early 50s. So this mannequin representing, um, obviously, 1953, just before moving out to Korea, this would be something that you would see on issue at the time, although many men would probably still have the tan example as well. Um, and as I say, it's interesting, this uh, design, of course, really dates back right to the First World War, so a very long-lived uh, bit of kit in that regard. You can see also the back of the belt here, obviously standard 1937 pattern, the brace is coming down to support the belt, uh, and on the left, uh, sorry, on the right hip here, we have the water bottle, which we'll take a look at in just a moment, which is obviously supported on the brace ends in standard practice for battle order. On the right hip here, we have the felt-covered enamel water bottle. Uh, again, little changed here from the Second World War, obviously. Uh, the, the setup is basically the same. It's in a skeleton water bottle carrier. You would also see, see sleeve types at this time as well, just depending on what was in stock to issue out. And uh, this is one of the, the elements of the, the, the equipment or, or one of the associated pieces of kit, which really by this point is getting rather dated. Obviously, the 1944 pattern water bottle and cup were in production at this point. The, the 1944 pattern web equipment and its accessories was essentially, with some exceptions, uh, designated as theatre issue. So it was being issued in Korea. The King's Own would, would be issued it uh, on heading out there in late 1953. Um, and it was also being issued out in Malaya. In Europe, you had to make do with all this older kit, uh, and that would remain essentially the same through to the end of the 1950s. Uh, by the 1960s, this was really uh, wanting replacing. It was very much out of date the elements of the design or elements of the associated equipment, such as the water bottle. But uh, that's how it was in uh, in Europe at this time. So there we are. That's the mannequin for uh, November 2019. Hope you found that interesting. It's been something that's been requested a few times, and I thought it'd be interesting to look at the soldier in the field in the early 1950s, as opposed to one who's uh, bulled up for parade ground for the parade ground. Um, obviously, the, there are some concessions made to practicality in the field, and obviously not uh, putting too much wear and tear on the battle dress uniform using denims, which are cheaper and more expendable. Uh, for field use. Very common to see, as I've already said in photographs at the time, is denims used in the field for this purpose. Uh, obviously very little departed from the Second World War uh, in terms of equipment and so, so on, which is not surprising. I mean, the US Army was in a similar position at this time. Most of their equipment was late Second World War production or late Second World War designs. Um, the Korean War would spur production of 1937 pattern again uh, in the updated form with quick release closures, which were around at this time as well. Obviously, late war production had been of that design with quick release uh, fastenings on the pouches, but you still see plenty of these wartime examples as well, uh, earlier war examples as well, excuse me, with the press stud. Um, so, you know, it's not dissimilar. Most armies were still in that position of using Second World War surplus or the equipment that they produced for use during the war, which had been produced in great quantity. Obviously, I said the King's Own would head off to Korea in 1953, uh, late 1953, after serving in Germany, and would see something of a quantum leap forward in their kit. They'd be issued a combat uniform, the 1944 pattern, which was a more thoroughly up-to-date web equipment made in green with blackened fittings and so forth. So the contrast between is quite interesting. Obviously, in active theatres, uh, the British Army was issuing out more modern kit, uh, and the same was true in Malaya. The 1944 pattern was considered to be a theatre issue, so it would be issued in the Far East. The combat uniform obviously developed for use or redeveloped for use in Korea. It had actually it predated Korea somewhat, the, the trials examples of it, uh, but it was something that was reimagined for use in the Korean theatre. Uh, it would then make its way back to Europe and would be issued in 
uh, issued out in um, uh, to troops on exercise, uh, then taken back, laundered and reissued out for other troops going out on exercise throughout the later 1950s. So that's something perhaps to look at in a future video. Uh, but that's, uh, as I say, that's all to come uh, at this point, still using very much this uh, kit and uniform, which would be very much recognisable to troops from the Second World War. So there it is. I think that's everything I wanted to cover in the video. Um, if you like my videos and you'd like to support the channel, there is, of course, a Patreon page. And obviously, as I've already said, the corporal tier on there, you get to vote in the poll, which decides what we're going to look at each month. Um, and obviously, if there is a tiebreaker, a tiebreaker on those polls, I'll do my best to cover both topics. Uh, there's also a PayPal link if you'd like to make a one-time donation. Uh, equally, if you'd like to support the channel, subscriber, new subscribers are always very much welcome. It's great when people subscribe. It's nice to see that number going up. And obviously, um, I'm assuming that makes, means I'm making uh, good videos and, and things people are interested in. Um, there's also Facebook and Instagram page. There'll be more detailed photographs of, of this up over there. So if you want to go and have a look at that, links to both of those in the description as well. Uh, but that's everything I wanted to cover in this video. So until next time, bye for now.